Welcome to the Potter Blog site, January 28th, Saturday, 2012. A uh, very disconcerting discovery out. Basically, the uh, the weaponization of uh, Fukushima fallout. It's naturally occurring f uh, weaponization. And uh, I guess let me go aside for a second and describe what I mean by weaponization. Uh, I think most people are familiar with anthrax. Um, if you just took a handful of naturally occurring anthrax spores and you threw them up into the air. If we were doing a vulnerability analysis, as you threw those naturally occurring anthrax spores up in the air, there'd be a kill probability of uh, one, which means 100%, probably within 100 meters downwind. And after that, the PKs would, uh, would drop off. Now, if it were weaponized anthrax, if you threw that same handful of anthrax into the air, uh, the PK values would probably remain at one for maybe a hundred miles downwind. Now the difference is in uh, weaponized anthrax versus regular an uh, naturally occurring anthrax is the anthrax, uh, each spore is basically free to float in the air by itself. It doesn't stick to the other spores. So it's a much smaller surface. It can travel much further in the wind and it can get much deeper into the lungs. Well, in essence, we've had something similarly similar occur here with uh, uh, uranium now coming out of uh, Fukushima and that's the formation of uh, fullerenes and what you see here in the image in front of you looks like a so uh, the structural skeleton of a soccer ball and that's in essence what this is and this one this fullerene is uh, made of carbon each one of these black dots here is a carbon atom and each one of those tubes connecting it are the uh, atomic bonds making the connection and if you notice the inside is hollow, that means that this uh, package here can actually deliver. There can be other atoms inside of here free floating that this uh, fullerene here can deliver. Those are called endofullerenes. Now what makes this troubling is these are nanoparticles, which means they're extremely strong, uh, extremely small, and in this case pretty strong too. Now uh, the discovery came here, and the story just recently released, and uh, these people here, I believe, deserve an award for uh, thinking of these possibilities and doing these tests. Now, the key thing to see through here is uh, basically, I'll read the abstract to you. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident brought together compromised, irradiated fuel in large amounts of seawater in, high, in a high radiation field. Based on newly acquired thermochemical data for a series of urinal peroxides, or should it be, yeah compounds containing charge balancing alkali uh, cations. Here we show that nanoscale cage clusters, and that's what you just saw in the image before, uh, nanoscale cage clusters, containing as many as 60 urinal ions bonded through peroxide and hydrogen bridges are likely to form in solution or as precipitates under such conditions. These species will enhance the corrosion of the damaged fuel and and this is where it gets to be critically important in being thermodynamically stable and kinetically persistent in the absence of peroxide that can potentially transport uranium over a long distance well there's a lot more to it than just that but uh, as people look back 50 years from now on the uh, cancer rates and the deaths associated with Fukushima this study here will probably be the uh, key indicator in a significant quantity of those cancers and deaths. Now, what's happened is, is that uh, uranium has formed this structure. So what we have now is a very small cohesive uh, structure of uranium atoms that basically don't stick to the other uranium atoms that are not inside the structure, that are not made of the structure. So they're free-floating nanoparticles that are stable. Stable in the water, stable in the air. It's the equivalent of the uh, anthrax model, which is these things are small, nanoscale, persistent, can spread over a large area. And what that means is that every simulation model showing the uh, transport and deposition of uh, fallout from Fukushima is potentially wrong fallouts in a, in a much broader area is transported much more easily. 
But even worse is the effects of uh, these uh, nanoparticles when they reach the body. And here's a, uh, a uh, chart for uh, uranium. It shows the lifetime cancer risk. And basically what all this refers to is the, uh, the reference dose. And a reference dose is the quantity of the contaminant, in this case uranium, that is uh, required to produce uh, an effect. Well, since, the, uh, since these particles are so small, they have a much easier time getting inside deep into the lungs. Uh, if you swallow them, they're much easily, more easily uh, ingested and absorbed through the, uh, through the intestines and they're much more likely to penetrate blood-brain barriers. Not only that, in the case of uranium, uh, uranium is a bone and kidney seeker. And so what will happen is, is these uranium atoms now have a, a, a much, let's call it a autobahn to your uh, inside of your body. Now, if we go back and look at the structure of this fullerene, inside here, can be trapped plutonium atoms, cesium atoms, any number of uh, whatever's in the fallout in the water or in the air as this uh, fullerene is being made, is being created, can be inside that. Now, so let's take for example plutonium. Say there's plutonium inside this fullerene, this uh, uranium buckyballs as they're often known and named after Buckminster Fuller, the person who popularized the geodesic dome. If there's plutonium inside this, usually a plutonium often is described as being only harmful if inhaled. Some people drink, claim you can drink plutonium because it'll pass through your body rapidly. Well, plutonium inside of this uh, fullerene, making an endofullerene, if this gets ingested, the uranium will pull this towards your bones and your kidney. In essence, it's a, uh, a cruise missile for the plutonium inside of it, or whatever else is inside of it. And it gets even worse. Now if you've got a radioactive particle inside here, surrounded by other high atomic weight radioactive particles, and you have a decay, you know, there's a possibility of localized fission in here. And even worse than that, since these particles are small, let's say they're outside the body. They go high in the upper atmosphere. So when we have solar storms and solar proton events, uh, especially proton events where the uh, geomagnetic structure of the Earth uh, alters enough that it's not all directed, that not all the protons are directed towards the poles, these types of structures provide a much, a much greater target for uh, spallation. So all around, this thing is just a, and this, people don't realize how bad of a news this is. And it's likely to be underreported how bad of a news this is. But if you're a reporter in Fukushima, or you're anywhere around Fukushima, and you're relying on an N95 or a surgical mask to keep you safe, yeah, you're hosed. I mean, this type of, this type of uh, contaminant requires at least a P100 respirator if not a uh, self-contained breathing apparatus. And, you know, it, if you've followed the Potter blog site, uh, one of the things we've stated before is we believe that a good portion of the corium is in the groundwater, and uh, at least since August. Now we've detected uh, short half-life radiation that bears out that. But uh, there's, there's a good news aspect to that, and is these things function in the presence of salt water. So if the corium is functionally being cooled by groundwater, then potentially there's less, a, a lesser likelihood of the current formation of these uh, uh, fullerenes and endofullerenes. But nobody really knows what the conditions are like in several of those reactors. But that would mean, if that's the case, and it's all being cooled by groundwater, then the majority of these uh, buckyballs, uranium buckyballs, were formed uh, within the uh, probably first six months of the accident. 
But now where it gets incredibly even more concerning is the uh, spent uh, fuel pool that people have claimed is on the verge of a collapse at Fukushima pending the right earthquake. That fuel pool, since it's elevated, is obviously still being cooled by uh, salt water. So that fuel pool has got to be forming just uh, buku fullerenes. That fuel pool collapses and these fullerenes spread. I mean, that means these uh, speedy models that Japan they use for evacuation purposes will be uh, not good enough. And if you're living in Tokyo, I'd suggest that uh, you have a uh, basically a gas mask ready, P100 military type gas mask. Uh, I think that there's a, a 3M type 64 filter that might do the might do the job. But you know, as I said before, people don't begin to even understand how concerning this information is. This is the type of thing where people look back in 50 to 100 years and they'll just be in utter amazement about the salt water being uh, thrown on these reactors and continuing to be thrown on these reactors. Hopefully it'll uh, spur the improvement or some thought of uh, improved uh, emergency or improvised cooling mechanisms for these type of uh, situations. Very troubling indeed.